On today's Locked On Jayhawks, Deshaun Warner is a Kansas Jayhawk, or at least committed to be for Kansas in full. He's the first D lineman of the class. The short mean group of 24, now that he's in tow for KU on this edition of Locked On Jayhawks. You are Locked On Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You can hear me as well Monday through Friday from 3 to 6 p.m. on KLWN in Lawrence with Rock Chalk Sports Talk. Thanks for making Locked On Jayhawks your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get any of your podcasts. You can also find us, like, and subscribe to the show on our YouTube page with Locked On Jayhawks. On today's edition of the show, we're talking to Sean Warner. He is a three-star commit for KU football, highly ranking defensive linemen, what it means for KU, what they're getting into Sean Warner, uh, what it means for the D-line group and the overall class of 2024 thoughts now as it continues to come together and honestly get close to, to being at this point for KU. Uh, first, though, the show is brought to you by Sportsbook, the official sports book of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started today. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, Deshaun Warner committing to KU. He is their first defensive lineman in the class of 2024. Who is Deshaun Warner? He is a six foot four, 225 pound edge, which in Kansas's 4 3 system means he'll be playing defensive end. Um, the, the schools that he picked Kansas over. Very, very good. And uh, specifically the schools that were finalists for him that he ended up picking KU on his um, live video was Texas, Oregon State, and Washington. And that was on Saturday when he made his decision known. There was some, I don't know, it's, it seemed like going into decision day that it was Kansas and Washington were like the two favorites, which, I mean, that is a heck of a win over all those schools that we just mentioned, but if you just think about it from the Washington perspective, Washington has put a ton of guys into the NFL over the last, I don't know, really ever since Chris Peterson took over. And then obviously they've had uh, the, it's then, um, but so what that puts you over the last like seven, eight years, something like that. They've put a ton of defensive guys into the NFL for you to land. This kid is a very, very big deal. He's ranked as the top 50 edge rusher on both the 24-7 sports rankings and the 24-7 sports composite rankings. And he comes in at number 673 nationally. So another top 1,000 recruit coming into KU. Um, and when you look at where he slots among all of KU's commits so far, he's the 14th commit. He is the fifth best recruit in the class, but he's not that far off from being you know, even higher up there. Uh, in those rankings in terms of edge slash defensive end recruits if you're looking to how good of a recruit is this for KU in terms of historically like what they've been able to reel in if you go back and, and you look at a 24 7 sports composite rankings and and the all-time commits for KU and you get rid of the Juco guys right gets rid of the guys like Markel Combs for instance um, so just in terms of edge slash defensive end players from the high school level Warner is the second best to ever commit to KU since 2010 per the 24-7 sports composite. So you're not typically getting in edges who are this good from a KU perspective, but that's what this staff, that's what this team is doing and building that they've been different and unorthodox from, from past staffs. Not only do you feel like you have the development and all that stuff and, and the game game planning and the consistency of a, a coaching staff like Lance Eipold, they're recruiting better than other levels that we've seen Kansas be able to do. Like that was the thing with David Beatty. It was like, oh, but he'll be a good recruiter. That was the thing with Les Miles is like, ah, I don't know where this is all going to go or, you know, is it too old school from an offensive perspective and game planning perspective, but should be able to recruit. The staff of Lance Leipold, the better other stuff, the game management, the X's and O's, the, all that stuff. You're also getting better recruiting at this point in time. Um, but for what it's worth, if you are wondering, because I said he is the number two ever 
high school commit who plays defensive end slash edge to commit to KU per those rankings? Who is number one, you might be asking? Well, the answer is Steven Parker, which that didn't totally work out at Kansas. Um, maybe it would have worked out if he would have stayed for this past year, or maybe it would have worked out for this upcoming season if you would have stuck around. He ended up going to Incarnate Word, who uh, was a semifinalist in the FCS playoffs last year, and he had a really good season for them. Now, that's obviously at a lower level. Maybe it just was never going to work with Stephen Parker, but that was a very big deal when you got him. And yeah, not every four-star kid is going to work out, and sometimes there are going to be kids who don't have a star ranking at all that are going to work out, right? They're, they're good stories and bad star stories from all sides. But if you continue to recruit this high of ranked players, yeah, not all of them are going to work out, but more often are than they're not. And you feel good about this commitment with Deshaun Warner. He completes the Desert Edge 3, which that's Desert Edge High School in Arizona. He's actually the fourth commit from the state of Arizona. Carter Lavruski does not play at Desert Edge, but he is from Arizona. He's an offensive lineman. Uh, but now you have Jonathan Kamara, who's going to be kind of that. I mean, I mean, mostly what you're hearing him profiled into is that Hawk position of the future where Craig Young is playing for KU, Andre Gibson, who's a corner, and now you bring in Deshaun Warner, who's a defensive end. So it's kind of funny that not only are you bringing in these three kids from this good high school in Arizona, but literally you're getting three different levels. You're going to defense lineman, linebacker, and DB. You're getting all three levels of your defense kind of covered from those three guys, which is a very big deal. And the more you can establish pipelines in, in certain states, the better that is, right? So uh, th that's never a bad thing, especially with how much talent all three of those kids do have. Uh, again, once more hat tip to uh, you know Jordan Peterson as the primary recruiter, the KU defensive back coach. And what he's been able to do on the recruiting trail is absolutely remarkable. Him and Chris Simpson have really... Uh, led to a lot of this. You do get credit, though. Taiwo Onotolu was a secondary recruiter here, and obviously KU does have, you know, the whole staff is is filling in at, at certain points, whether it's an offense coordinator, defense coordinator uh, coming by in the visit, or Lance Leipold. Like, there are more guys than just those primary recruiters to, you know, give praise to for these recruits. But Jordan Peterson keeps popping up on a lot of these names. He's been one of the best recruiting assistant coaches so far in the conference, and, and he's been very darn... And, and, and uh, you, you give credit to, to what he's been able to do on the recruiting trail and kind of establish that pipeline so far right now in uh, Arizona. Now, as far as the scouting report for what Deshaun Warner is bringing to the table, obviously 6'4", 225 pounds. You're going to be looking to add weight to him. But, you know, what high school kid aren't you looking to add weight to when they're coming in? Um, Lonnie Phelps played at like 245. He also was maybe closer to being like 6'2", 6'3". So with Warner, maybe you can get him up to like two. 250 something like that clearly at the very least 15 20 pounds if you can do that you've got a really strong potential for him to be a, a real big impact player um he's known as being a good athlete off the edge there was some there was a, a video that kevin flaherty of 24 7 sports tweeted out showing kind of his first step in, in ability to rush the passer like very good twitchy athlete michael swain of uh, fog.net actually gave out a comparison and the person that he gave out was Dorrance Armstrong, which Dorrance Armstrong ended up being a what preseason Big 12 player of the year, had a couple really impactful seasons at Kansas, ended up being an NFL draft pick and, and has had a solid NFL career with the Dallas Cowboys so far. Uh, that would if, if you're saying Deshaun Warner is going to end up being Dorrance Armstrong, you take that and you run to the bank because boy, boy would that be full for KU. So uh, a very possibly good uh, being made. All right, we're going to get on to uh, what it means for the defensive line, what it means for the edge position group, what it means for the class of 2024 as they continue to recruit it. Um, we're also going to get to overall thoughts on the class of 2024 here. In just First, though, this episode of the show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Take your first swing at betting MLB on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets, $200. That's right. Just bet 20 bucks and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's 200 you can bet on everything from the money line to the over under to who you think is going to hit the first home run of a baseball game. All on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you get paid 
instantly. There's no better place to bet on MLB than at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So sign up today and visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, an official partner of Major League Baseball. All right, so of, of the KU defense and the edge position. Uh, so as, as far as uh, the class, Deshaun Warner is now one of your 14 commits for the class. I do think that KU is flexible in all this. Like, they have certain allotments um, of this, how many scholarships we want for this position and that position. But if a good enough player via transfer, for or if your school wants to come, you're not going to say no. So they are flexible in the same way of the high school numbers. There's a certain number that they're probably comfortable with so that they can be like, well, if if we bring in, you know, say 15 high school commits, we can bring in 10 transfer portal players. And that, that's a number we're comfortable with. But again, if, if you're at 15 high school committing a, a high school player who you really like is like, hey, I want to commit. You're not going to be like, ah, sorry. We already have 15 commits. We can't take it. No, they'll just be flexible, and they'll take one less transfer guy. So there is enough flexibility here. But um, in talking with Michael Swain, again, of Fog.net on, on Rock Chalk Sports Talk last week, he was talking about how he thinks like 16 could be the number they take in, in high school, somewhere around there. So if we figure somewhere between 15 to 17, that means that there's not a ton left. That means that they can be a little bit more choosy. That means that they have more time during the season to focus on other things like game planning, like uh, look into the transfer portal like recruiting the class of 2025 and then just focusing on continuing to recruit the commits that you have as opposed to you know right more thin that's very important to have this done earlier on and now you're at a point where you only are going to need one or two or three more kids as, as part of the high school class uh like every position is checked off though when you look at who they've added in you're bringing in a quarterback with Isaiah Marshall. You have two running backs in tow. You have a tight end. You have three offensive linemen, a couple of linebackers, including one that plays the Hawk. You have four defensive backs, and now you have an edge. But you could use even more uh, defensive linemen. Now, if you notice there, I didn't mention receiver, but they just brought in three receivers in, in the class of 2023. And I think the only receiver who has to graduate at the end of the year is Kevin Terry. Now, who knows if, if you lose any players via the transfer portal or going early to pro or, you know, maybe they do graduate and they're just ready to move on. You don't know that, but you feel like you're pretty good at the receiver unless there's a good enough player that makes you want to take one of those exceptions. <clears throat> Nick Marsh, right? Okay. So that makes sense, but you definitely need more defensive line. You could probably use another edge. You could probably use like an interior guy even. Maybe, maybe not. Um, so at the very least, the way you look at it, okay, maybe KU is only going to bring in two more high school commits. Maybe both are on the defensive line. Maybe they're only going to bring in one more, right? Um, and, and then they can fill the rest with transfer portal pickups. So as big of a get as this is with Deshaun Warner being a really good player, somebody who profiles into being possibly a really elite player for you, there's still work to be done on the defensive line even after this. This this isn't one of those, it's like, all right, check that off the list. Now they're completely done. That's basically the one position still that they need more, but this is a great start to have. And that becomes even more important because, you know, you look at this season. So at the end of this year, at the end of the 2023 football season for KU, Patrick Joyner will have graduated. Hayden Hatcher will have graduated. And both those guys are in competition to be one of the starters. You think Jeremy Robinson's going to start at one? Those could be the top two candidates to start the other. Maybe, maybe not. At the very least, both of those are going to be rotation players if they're both healthy. Uh, Devin Phillips, who's your transfer you brought in from Colorado State. He's going to graduate at the end of the year. Ron McGee, who, who's kind of a depth piece interior. He's going to graduate at the end of the year. Um, and then Jeremy Robinson is in his junior season, which means 2024 would be his final season. So you got to plan for, you know, even beyond that. And, and who knows? What if Jeremy Robinson... Uh, you know, continues your lineage here that you've had of Kyron Johnson, to Lonnie Phelps, and he becomes that next really strong pass rusher. And he has an opportunity to do what Lonnie Phelps did. And I know Lonnie Phelps went undrafted, but he says, ah, screw it. I'm, I'm going to go to the draft, right? You, you never know for sure. You want to set yourself up there. Um, and then of course, like KU has other young talent waiting in the wings at both edge and defensive tackle who will be on the two deep this year or maybe not kind of be that next up, whether it's players you brought in like Austin Booker and Gage Keys, whether it's um, 
guys who you feel like are going to break out this year, like at the defensive tackle position uh, with your Tommy Duns and DJ Withers of the world, whether it's your guys that you've brought in in like the class of 2023, like Tony Terry, who you feel like could be something for you in a few years down the road. But you're always building to the future, and you can never have enough defensive linemen. Um, we've heard from like Jim Panagos last offseason about how you know it's not really a set number. Like we we don't go into a year with being like ah we're we're going to play eight defensive linemen every year or, or every game. Uh, that's our thing we're doing. No, he's just like if we have enough good ones, we'll find playing time for them. Like maybe uh, because especially that position. And with how many teams run um, te- up tempo in the Big 12, you want to keep guys fresh. You want to ga- keep guys healthy over the course of the season, right? Think about the, some of the teams that run super high tempo in the conference. Oklahoma, TCU, Texas Tech. Like These are teams that run fast-paced offenses. And having better depth to get you through injuries over the course of the season and to get you through all that stuff, you can never have enough of those defense alignment. If they have 10 good ones, they'll rotate all 10 in. So uh, that's part of this. But also you're looking for possible impact defense alignment, which – you know, is something that you have had with Kyron Johnson and Lonnie Phelps the past two years. And you have a question about, can Jeremy Robinson be that guy? Will somebody else be that guy, be an impact defense lineman this year? John Warner profiles into being someone who you feel like can eventually be an impact defensive lineman in addition to giving you another talented body uh, on, on that side of things. All right, we're going to finish up here with Locked on Jayhawks. Overall thoughts on the class of 2024. Now the KU is at 14, and you know maybe they are inching closer to being done recruiting from the high school uh, level of things here at Locked on Jayhawks. Finishing things up with Locked on Jayhawks. Overall thoughts on the class of 2024 now it is uh, the 14. 14- commit class i have uh about um the high school recruits for ku that that they're bringing in and the different classes over the past years and what exactly players being like top 1000 recruits so i have an update to that i'll show it to you now now uh, there is actually a slight difference now um, some of the rankings have been updated, you know, so you have certain guys who maybe weren't ranked and then they commit. So then they do a ranking for them. And so that has bumped some of KU's players who were recruits outside of the top 1000, just barely. Now, if you look at it, the 14 commits, they still have three top 500s, which is the second that they've had since 2010, which is the 24 seven composite launch. Um, so that's really impressive, especially when you compare it to the other ones that had three or four had 32 and 24 kids respectively in terms of the amount of commitments. So again, like uh, the red basically means the most since 2010, the blue means first most, the yellow means third most. Um, so KU is doing well, top 500 kids, top 600 kids, top 800 kids. And then you look at the percentage of them just to give you a better idea of the quality of players since you're not bringing in the quantity. Well, 50% of your kids, Kids are top 1,000, and the second most was last year. So the amount of players that you're stacking onto each other back-to-back years is really impressive. But because some of those kids were top 1,000 commits and just barely fell out because somebody else got ranked and it scooted them down just a tiny bit, or who knows? I, I feel like there has been a weird correlation where, you know, we see this in basketball where a lot of times a kid commits to KU basketball and it feels like their recruiting ranking goes up. I almost feel like the opposite is happening with football where it's like, oh, kid commits to KU, all right, we're going to drop his recruiting ranking just a little bit. I don't know if that's true or not. It just sometimes feels that way because, you know, if you're looking at, at kids who are, were at one point a top 1,000 commit, this might be 9 or 10 on the list. So instead, what I wanted to do is not just look at the ranking, but on 24-7 sports, the composite, there is a grade. So it's like point three two one, right? And and that's the number of how they're putting together all these different recruiting sites. So 0. 0.8600 is an interesting number because it would represent a, a nice little jump up for KU as the overall class. And as you can see, recruits that they brought in with a grade of 0. 0.8600 or better, you know, from from really what 2015 through 2022 you're mostly only bringing in one two three of those per year with the exception really of that 2019 season when you brought in six of them but this year for the class of 2024 10 of your 14 commits are 0.860 or higher last year it was nine of your 14 so that means the percentage of your commits 
to our point zero higher, which again, that, that sounds like an arbitrary number, but it really is a, a jump off for what would be a jump up in the level of talent that KU is bringing in. That means that over 70% of KU's commits are 0. 0.8600 grades or higher. Last year it was 64%. So the top two years for KU since 2010. And the distance between those two and the next best, the third best for your percentage of commits in a class that were 0. 0.8600 or higher. You have to go all the way back to 2010 when it was 33%. So you were more than doubling that up with your overall team recruiting ranking is 40. Um, that's not going to be something that I'm honestly looking at that much because if KU only brings in another high school recruiter or two and you have 15 or 16 kids, it's going to be hard to compare those to classes that have 20 or 25 kids. Of course, they're going to be ranked lower than some of those uh, different you know, teams or, or schools across the country. But when you look at the quantity of the player that KU is bringing in, this is unprecedented for what to do and very, very impressive there. Are that episode of find me on twitter at d johnson radio you can find our podcast wherever you get any of your podcasts and you can also find us on our youtube page where you can like and subscribe to the show we'll see you next time with on jayhawk